code, so I'm going to get record for you and send them an email right now. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so let me remind everyone, t today's Wednesday, right? <laughs> so tomorrow we have um, a, a lecture in the morning and a problem session in the afternoon, okay? All right. At three in this, ro in this room. Did Jean, did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. Uh, okay, so where are we here in, in this uh, attenuation or absorption of sound, you know, acoustic losses? We've looked at the um, effect of viscosity. We looked at the effect of thermal conduction. We've established some other useful results along the way. And... Uh, now what we want to do is bring the, the viscous and the thermal results together. So, so this is often called uh, th uh, thermoviscous. You can call this thermoviscous losses. So at least that's what I call it, although not here. Um, here's how uh, the pressure amplitude for a traveling wave attenuates due to viscosity. Here's how it attends similarly for a thermal conduction with different absorption coefficients here. And this, we've derived this for uh, small losses. This holds in the small loss limit, which is typically the case. When we combine these two, we just get um, an exponential decay, but it'll be decaying at, um, at this rate. The, the, the Total absorption coefficient is just the sum of the individual absorption coefficients. Okay, now we call this, well, what we're headed towards here is what's called the classical absorption coefficient. And it's not obvious what people mean by classical here, but I'll tell you right now, and you'll see this in depth starting today. Um, we mean that we're treating the medium as a continuum. We're neglecting the fact that ultimately, if you zoom way in on, the, on a medium there, you're going to see molecules or atoms, right? And you might think that just wouldn't make any difference here because we have such huge wavelengths compared to the microscopic scale, right? But it turns out there's something very dramatic happening here. So anyway, so that's why this word is... There's a reason for this word here, and it's just, it's not evident right in the beginning. But for right now, just take it to mean it's, we're dealing with a continuum here. We're neglecting any kind of microscopic effects due to the discretization of matter. This neglects that, These, the viscosity and the thermal conduction. We're treating the medium as a continuum. Okay, now before we go on here, I just want to make a, a brief comment. We want to make contact with the quality factor so this is appropriate for standing waves, right? Quality factor for a resonator. Uh, usually in the theory course here, as I mentioned before, we're doing propagating waves, but you, know, you can get a standing wave by superposing equal amplitude traveling waves, counter moving in opposite directions, right? So when you deal with resonators, and you excite a mode and you're not driving it, it decays exponentially in time. And the decay constant here, also known as the damping parameter, which we call, I think KFC has called beta, um, is related to the Q. The bigger beta is, the lower the Q. And here's the relationship that you derived last quarter in 3119. It probably first came up in a harmonic oscillator, almost certainly, harmonic oscillator. This is where this came up. Um, a damped harmonic oscillator. So the harmonic oscillator will decay in time exponentially, and here's the, the damping parameter here that sits here. Uh, what's the connection? So we can also have an acoustic resonator, of course, like the first experiment. What's the connection between what we've been doing here in space, the attenuation of a traveling wave in space, compared to the, uh, the decay of the amplitude in time? Well. Um, we've actually, are, we encountered this yesterday, 
the simple relationship here between alpha and beta, and you can get it just from really from dimensional analysis, is that beta is equal to alpha times the speed of sound. And what's behind this, I kind of mentioned it yesterday, I didn't get into the details, is you can imagine moving along what you can connect what's happening in space and time by considering a traveling wave. If you just look at the traveling wave in the laboratory flame, frame, the amplitude decays exponentially in space. If you move along with the wave, it decays in time. And this is easy, it's easy to show that this is the connection between the two. Um, I guess to make the, the final step here to connect it with the standing wave, you need to add two counter traveling waves. Okay, but anyway, this is, the, this is the connection between the two. So our quality factor here, and oh, now that I think of it, we're going to encounter this later, um, later in the course. We'll encounter this in the theoretical part of this course, okay? That we take this quality factor here, we make the substitution beta is equal to alpha c, and we get this expression right here. So this is the quality factor um, from a sort of traveling wave, I, I guess you can think of it as a traveling wave point of view. It's the wave number divided by two times the absorption coefficient. And like I said, now that I remember this, I think we're going to, uh, the last thing we'll do here in this course, we'll, I think we will encounter this. Um, now one final thing here, and you'll remember this from the Helmholtz uh, experiment, and I'm struggling grading those reports. There's a lot in that experiment. But I'll eventually get done. Anyway, um, you'll remember there that you were able to cal calculate the Q's, theoretically calculate the Q's. And the total Q, you, the total Q is not the sum of the individual Q's, which is actually clearly not right. You have, you have to add them in quadrature, okay? So um, the reason for that is that Q is inversely proportional, or Q, Q, Q is proportional to one over the absorption coefficient. So the absorption coefficients add here. When you have more than one mechanism, you add the absorption coefficients. So because the Q is proportional to one over this, the Q's add in reciprocal. Uh, okay. So what we call the, what is called the classical absorption coefficient is, uh, we'll call, following KFCS, we'll call it alpha sub C, C for classical. It's the sum of the viscous and thermal absorption coefficients. And the, the bulk viscosity is set equal to zero here. You remember, I don't think I wrote it in here, but this has, there's, a, there's shear and bulk viscosity shear viscosity and sort of bulk viscosity. It's set equal, we'll talk more about this later on in the course, but it's set to zero here. It's, appro it's often approximately equal to zero. So we end up with what's called the classical absorption coefficient for thermal viscous losses. All right? It's um, proportional to the square of the frequency as we've commented here. And here's the shear viscosity. <coughs> here's the thermal conductivity, the ratio of specific heats, and this is the heat capacity. And um, this is true for any fluid, right? Even though we derive this for an ideal gas, as I mentioned yesterday, it turns out in this form, it's true for any fluid. I don't think KFCS comment about that now that I think about it, but I can't remember. Uh, now, we're going to find that uh, for gases, these things are, are typically on this, roughly the same order of magnitude. They're comparable to each other, the viscous and the thermo terms here. For liquids, however, <coughs> um, well, this is not, I need to edit this. For um, non-metallic liquids, Uh, often the viscous, not always, but um, often the, the uh, viscous effect dominates. And I used to think, if you look at this, if you look at this sentence right here, is that 
liquids are hard to compress, right? So a sound wave in a liquid, you have these pressure swings, but you really don't have, you have much less condensation in a liquid than in a gas because it's hard to compress a liquid. So in the past, I thought, well, you know, you're, you're only going to get thermal losses if, you have, if the temperature is swinging significantly, right, as we discussed yesterday. Um, <clears throat> but I don't, <clears throat> I don't think this is right because you, you could make the same argument for viscosity if you don't have much displacement, okay? For, so for sound and liquid, you, have, you don't have much vis displacement because it's, liquids are hard to compress. So the, vis the viscous effect is going to be small too. So I don't, I don't think this is right. And I didn't get this from the book incident. I just came up with it myself. So I, what I suspect is going on here, I'm going to look into it a little more, is that um, this typical case where uh, viscosity dominates the thermal effect in liquids is probably just due to the thermal conductivity being um, The thermal conductivity, this, th this, this factor being small compared to the shear viscosity when you do it correctly with units. That's probably what's going on here. Now we have a nice way of uh, <coughs> comparing these two. Why would you want to, you know, you might think, well, why don't you just calculate, why do you worry about this? Well, if one of these is dominating, it's, it's usually a good thing to know. And that's a general statement when you're dealing with some kind of physical system. If, you're, if you can make approximations in the physical system you're dealing with, it's usually a good idea to do so. You simplify what's going on. You get a better feel for what's going on. So it's, it's often useful to, um, to do that. So, and it turns out that um, <clears throat> There's a dimensionless, you know, fluid mechanics is loaded with dimensionless numbers. The Reynolds number is usually the first number. For those of you who've had some fluid mechanics, the Reynolds number is the first one you encounter. But there's on the order of 100, believe it or not, dimensionless numbers in fluid mechanics. <clears throat> and they're useful because what we've encountered here, you, 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 it's almost always good to know what regime you're in. Are we in a, happen to be in a regime where viscosity is dominating this? the thermal effect or vice versa. So you can take the ratio of these two, and that has to be dimensionless, the ratio of these two numbers. And that turns out to be close to, roughly close to what's called the Prandtl number. And the Prandtl number is defined <coughs> to be the shear viscosity times the heat capacity at constant pressure divided by the thermal conductivity. Okay, this is a dimensionless number. And um, it's useful for us because we can see here, if you take the ratio of these two terms, if you, if you take um, the, oh gosh, which, which way is it? <laughs> Hold on here. If you take this divided by that, okay? And this is all sort of order of magnitude stuff. The four thirds is not important. It's not gonna be important. Gamma is of the order of Unity. Ga gamma is, is seldom, if ever, very small compared to one or very large compared to one. It's typically on the order of unity. So we can forget that. If you forget this, you see that the ratio of the, the viscous to the thermal term is just this Prandtl number. So this is useful because um, you can look these up. You can look Prandtl numbers up. And if we do have a fluid where the Prandtl number is large, uh, that's telling us that the, the absorption is going to be dominated by viscosity. On the other hand, if the Prandtl number is very small, then the thermal conduction dominates the viscosity. Dominates the viscosity, right? It's, it's the main, the absorption is due almost completely to the thermal conduction. Um, now, sometimes relaxation times are important. And there you can easily show that you can use the Prandtl number. It's the same, same idea. You're, uh, you can easily see that the ratio of the relaxation times is also approximately equal to the Prandtl number, just like it is for the ratio of the absorption coefficients. Okay, so there's the theory. Uh, I don't know how long this has been around, probably a very long time. Um, you know, my guess is 
first half of the 1900s, uh, probably, this was derived. Somewhere in there is my guess. Uh, what happens when you compare it to experiment? Well, here's where it gets interesting, okay? So here's this uh, table that we've discussed before that has this really weird, you know, I, I <laughs> the glycerin thing, remember that? This came up in a problem. <coughs> so the only thing I can think of, these were like placeholders. They just shoved, I don't know, somebody shoved this in here and they never edited it. That's the only thing I can think of. It's obviously very suspicious here for glycerin. Um, <coughs> So um, what, what you find, if you look at this table, what you find is for, um, if you look at, the, here's the classical absorption coefficient. Now, what's plotted here, as I've mentioned to you before, what's tabulated here, because the absorption coefficient is frequency dependent, we just remove the frequency from, from the values here by dividing by the square of the frequency. And you know, this is f experimental stuff like this. They're going to use the real frequency, f. In th for theory, we use omega because it's convenient. So you always need to be aware of this when you're you know, doing any kind of computations here. So the alpha divided by f squared here is predicted to be a constant by the theory. Here's the prediction. Here's the classical absorption coefficient okay, for gases. And you can see for a no, there's no argon, it works pretty well. Um, helium, pretty good. Oxygen, we're starting to see some little bit of deviation here, and nitrogen. And then what we really care about <laughs> the most, for ga the most important gas for us is air, right? And it's, they don't even tabulate it, right? It just, <laughs> they don't, uh, and it's because it's, um, it's not a constant. When you divide by, the, this is a theoretical, this should be a constant according to the theory, right? It's not constant. It has a peak at 40 hertz. Big problem here, okay? Uh, carbon dioxide, also another problem. We're going to look in depth at carbon dioxide because it's simpler to deal with, with air. And I'm sure this is what happened historically when people started to figure this, all this out in the second half of the 1900s. This was a good testing ground here, carbon dioxide. So we'll look at this in depth eventually. Um, tomorrow or the fall or the or Monday. Okay, so there's a problem here. There's also a problem for liquids. Um, it's not bad. Mercury conductive liquid is not bad. Um, look at well. Let's just jump to water here. This is pure water. Um, they don't. I don't know why they don't put a number in here. Water has some thermal conductivity. Right? <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't know if this signifies that it's very small. I don't know. I'll probably be looking it up since I want to clean up this thing that we just talked about, uh, that I talked about in the previous page here, about is there some physical reason for why the viscosity is dominating the thermal conduction for liquids? Anyway, um, Factor of three, and gr it's greater, okay, by a factor of three. That's, that's big, right? Now, if it were less, we would have a serious problem. That would really be interesting, okay? But when you see this, this is like quality factor, and you've seen this before in the lab. When you see something like this, what is this telling you? It's telling us we have, you know, substantially greater dissipation here, loss of acoustic energy. There's some mechanism that we're not including in the theory, one or more mechanisms, okay? Um, and then here for seawater, you know, a thing that the Navy cares more about than water is uh, it's not even tabulated, it's not constant. So there's something's going on here, something big. And it took a while for this to be figured out. And it's pretty well nailed down now, although not completely. So we will see this in the next, next few lectures, and we'll start today. Uh, okay, let me see if I missed anything here. Um, yeah, so believe it or not, um, 
And this is where physicists get excited and non-physicists go, oh really, do we really have to do this? <laughs> What's happening here is quantum mechanics. You cannot neglect quantum mechanics. Now, to this point in this course, we haven't, we've just been doing purely classical theory. We haven't had to worry about quantum mechanics. And you wouldn't think you'd have to worry about it here, but you have to worry about it. Quantum mechanics is what's responsible for this right here. This factor of three, it's quantum mechanics, and here too. And it's very surprising, and it turns out to be very interesting. And it appears that there's sti still more research needs to, that needs to be done, as we will discuss. According to the book, they're not real clear about it, but it, it, uh, it appears that um, there's room for more research here. Okay. So, um, here's the idea. What's, what's happening here, what, what, what can um, almost completely explain what's going on. And again, it doesn't appear, according to our book, it doesn't appear that this has all been explained. And we'll, I'll point this out to you when we hit it. But what's going on here is, um, several things. One of them is called molecular thermal relaxation. And here's, here's the idea. You need to look at, mo molecules can have internal motion. For example, they can have, um, you know, if you have a diatomic molecule, for example, it can vibrate, right? You can have a vibrational mode. Um, and it can rotate, right? Okay, these are internal, we call these internal degrees of freedom. Energy can go into there. So here's the idea. You got a molecule, you got this sound wave coming by. The sound wave has huge wavelength. That doesn't really matter here, okay? When the sound wave comes by and it's a compression, this molecule is gonna be in a, 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 an, an environment with an increased temperature, right? So energy, it's got these internal motions. Energy is going to go from the sound wave into these internal motions, all right? And similarly, when, um, when there's an expansion, when the sound wave come by, comes by and there's an expansion, energy will go out, okay? And what's important here is the fact that when this sound wave comes by and it gets hotter, some time is required for the energy to go into those internal motions. There is a relaxation time. Okay. You know there's going to be a relaxation time. It's absolutely unavoidable. Physically, you know that. The question is, is it short or is it long? That's, that's the question. So we have three different situations here. And what's relevant, as we've seen before, is not just the relaxation time by itself. That's, that's not relevant. It's the dimensionless number that's the product of the frequency of the wave times the relaxation time here. This is a dimensionless number. And when this, when this number, this is going to dictate what's going on. When omega times tau is small, so again, there's some kind of, re the relaxation time will depend upon the mode. But just assume, just focus your attention on one of these modes, let's say a, a vibrational mode. There's going to be some characteristic time for the energy of the sound wave to get into there. When the frequency of the sound wave times that relaxation time is very small, okay, now that means that we can neglect the fact that there's a relaxation time. It's essentially instantaneous. The frequency of the wave is so small that when it comes along here and it, it starts to get warmer, there's pl it's doing it so slowly that there's plenty of time for the energy to go into the molecular. It essentially tracks, let's use a word that's appropriate here. The energy in the molecule tracks the acoustic wave. So as it comes by and it's hotter, the energy goes up, it just goes down together. There's no phase difference between the two. There's no lag, okay? So this is gonna lead to negligible, this is not gonna lead to any loss of acoustic energy. It will change the speed of sound, okay? But it's not gonna give rise to any loss. Similarly, let's now jump to, yeah, here. Now suppose that the frequency of the wave is very, very high, okay, compared to the relaxation time. So now the sound wave comes by and it's going very quickly. There's no time. The relaxation time is now relatively slow or relaxation you know, time is large. 
So there's no time for the energy to go into the molecule there. There's no exchange of energy, so there's very little acoustic loss. Here's the interesting case. When you're in the, roughly in this regime, when very roughly, when omega times tau is equal to 1, now the sound wave comes by, and let's say it's a compression, so it's heating up. Now it takes some time for the energy to get in here. During that time, the wave has moved along, right? And now it's, there's going to be a, it's going to be cooler here. There'll be an expansion. So now the, the, the energy comes in, and then as, it's, as the wave moves on, it's going to come out. The energy will come out when it's roughly during an expansion. So what is that, what's happening to the amplitude of our wave? We talked a little bit about this before. It's going to go down, right? You're adding heat when it's cold, you know, when, when you have an expansion. So this is going to lead to significant, um, this can lead to significant loss of acoustic energy. So this is what we need to calculate here. Okay, and I want to point out that the situation here is very similar to that um, piston cylinder uh, system that we dealt with. When you have a fluid in here, if you're, um, and it's connected to a, to, a, to a thermal bath here, T naught. When you make um, <coughs> slow changes here to the piston, okay? You're putting energy into this into the system. It's going into here and, and, and when you draw it out, energy's coming back. There's no net energy loss, right? Because it's all done quasi, we call this quasi-statically. Similarly, when you do it very quickly, now there's not enough time for the heat to flow here. Uh, not so quickly that you generate shock waves. Remember that, okay? But still, fast, relatively fast. Now when you do it, there's no time, relative, fast relative to the time it takes heat to flow here. Now there's no time for this heat to be lost in there. So you're just adiabatically compressing and expanding the gas. You're putting energy in, you're getting energy out. You don't lose any, you're not dissipating any energy. Here. It's when you're um, in this regime right here, Analogous to this is that's where you get the loss of energy. So this is an analogous to this. What's what's going on here? It's a nice model to to think of to get a feel for what's going on here. So how do we handle this? Whoa. How do we um, calculate this? Well, the um, one perspective is the answer is with difficulty. It's not real simple. <laughs> it's not real simple. But we we're going to go through all this in the next starting today, I think, and then um, tomorrow. But we'll get through it, okay? We're not gonna, we're, we won't get bogged down in the derivation, but it's very interesting to see. And, you know, it's, it's of obvious importance. Just to say, well, we know sound attenuates and we can empirically quantify it is, um, that's not really what science is about. You know, that's part of science, but we want to be able to understand what's going on. Right? We want to be able to calculate. This, this, there's huge advantages in being able to do this, to be able to cal not just rely on empirical data without knowing what's going on, what's the reason. So we're going to go through this, but before we do it, we have to uh, back up here and do something that all of you should have had in a modern physics course. It's... Um, So I don't know about the USW students. Do you guys did you guys take modern physics? I didn't. Yeah, you're different because you're engineering. Because I'm in applied. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know about the distance learning students, but um, everybody who goes to a university or 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 a college or you know, just a community college, okay? All right, let's, let's push it down into high school, okay? If you go to high school, which I think most people do, um, you should be exposed to modern physics, okay? And what modern physics is, is it involves quantum mechanics and uh, relativity, Einstein's theory of relativity. And um, we simply cannot live without the knowledge. And a modern t with our modern technology, modern science, we can't live without knowledge of quantum mechanics and relativity. 
For example, the GPS system, which is used, just highly prevalent out there, has to include general relativistic corrections. General relativity is Einstein's theory of gravitation. It's a lot more complicated than so-called special relativity. Special relativity, you know, is the time dilation stuff, length contraction, you've probably heard of. The theory of gravitation is a lot more complicated, but there's a very important application of that is that the precise clocks that they use for, the, for GPS have to be adjusted due to general relativistic effects. All right? So anyway, but so some of you may have had this before, but it doesn't matter. We're going to go through what we need to, to handle this acoustic absorption due to molecular internal motion. So this is often called the quantum theory of heat capacity. And it's, it's very interesting historically because heat capacity is something that's, people have been measuring that for centuries. You know, how much heat do you have to add to raise the temperature a degree? Okay, I know a, a lot of work was done in the 1800s on this and I'm sure it goes back to the 1700s and probably before. Okay, this is not a difficult thing to measure. And um, the problem is, is that um, the, theory, the classical theory breaks down. It's very easy to see. And it, only, it was only with quantum mechanics that we can understand the heat capacity. So here's the idea. <coughs> we begin here um, with some, a definition. It's called a degree of freedom. This is for, from statistical physics. Not from mechanics. It's a little different than mechanics. But from statistical physics, a degree of freedom is just a... Um, it's a, it's a form that energy can reside in a system. So every molecule has, um, energy can reside in a molecule in different forms. Each form is called a degree of freedom. Okay, and I'll be, I'll be a little more clear about that in a moment. So every molecule has three translational degrees of freedom, because you can have kinetic energy this way, this way, and that way, right? So there are three, degree, three translational degrees of freedom. We really can't do anything about uh, <laughs> So, okay, the reason I'm hesitating is that I was about to make a statement that was correct, in, uh, strictly incorrect. Um, you might think here that you're always going to have three degrees of freedom. Well, it's actually not true. If you cool down a system to extremely small temperatures, Okay, where the de Broglie wavelength, the wavelength that characterizes the quantum mechanical wave, uh, wave function here, is comparable to the size of your container. You can actually, uh, we call it freeze these out. But don't worry about that. Just forget, just strike it, forget that I said it, okay? So there are these three translational degrees of freedom. Um, what about rotations? How many degrees of freedom are there there? Well, that's not obvious, and we're going well, to explain that to you in a few minutes, all right? <clears throat> but there can be, in principle, you know, if I've got some kind of molecule here, it can be rotating about three axes. So in general, there should be three degrees of freedom there, okay? What about vibrations? How many degrees of freedom? I think I heard somebody say one. Yeah, it's not one, it's two, it turns out to be two, because energy can reside in, as kinetic energy and potential energy. And it turns out you've got to count that twice. This is from statistical physics. So we have to count that one twice, all right? Now, there's a famous result due to Boltzmann that um, the second half of the 1800s, that um, when a system is in, and this is very general, when a system is in thermal equilibrium, the, on the average, the energy is equal partitioned among all the different degrees of freedom. That's nice. It's about as simple as it can be. So it doesn't matter what the nature of the degree of freedom is. On the average, if the system's in thermal equilibrium, you know, there's a constant temperature everywhere, on the average, there's the same amount of energy in each. It can fluctuate, but on the average it's the same. And that happens to be one-half Boltzmann's constant times the absolute temperature. This is the famous equipartition theorem of classical statistical mechanics. <coughs> um, so, the heat capacity 
per mole. The heat capacity is the amount of energy you have to add to raise the temperature one degree, okay? The heat capacity per mole is then going to be, at constant volume here, is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature by one degree Celsius, which is the same as one, an interval of one degree Celsius is the same as one Kelvin. This is one of the reasons the Celsius scale is better than the Fahrenheit scale, one of a number of reasons. But the interval is the same here. I should have, I'll, I'll edit that in. The heat capacity is going to be this energy divided by the temperature here. We, it's, it's per degree, so we divide by the temperature. So it's one half Boltzmann's constant. We need to multiply by the number of, um, by the number of particles in a mole, because we're going to deal with the heat capacity per mole. So that's Avogadro's number. And then you simply multiply by, by the total number of degrees of freedom. Each degree of freedom contributes the same. Every degree of freedom, you've got to put energy in there. Okay? So we end up with the heat capacity here per mole being um, the universal gas constant, which is constant, which is just Boltzmann's constant times Avogadro's number times one half. So this is the, the heat capacity per mole. It's a constant. It's very simple. Okay? Here's the problem. When you compare this to experiments, and these, again, these experiments are easy to do. There's cal so-called calorimetry experiments. Where you add heat and with the temperature change. Um, there's, there can be very strong disagreement. And the only way that they can be explained is with quantum mechanics. So here's the idea. This is a simple idea. I wanna, I wanna try to make sure you get it. So it's a very simple idea. What happens here is that when we look at this internal, the motion of these molecules, particularly the, in, the internal motion, there just can't be any energy in there. The energy is discretized. There are energy levels. So if you look at energy, if you think of um, look, focusing your attention on a certain mode and looking at the energy in that mode, there is a ground state, okay, state of lowest energy, called the ground state. And then there are these levels up here, higher energy levels. And <coughs> at, low, at sufficiently low temperature, the the, this degree of freedom is going to be in the ground state, all right? These are not, there's no energy here accessible. This is the first excited state. So if you're looking at a degree of freedom here and you want it and you're, you're adding heat, okay, because you want to raise the temp, you want to look at the heat capacity and you're adding heat. If you don't kick this molecule up into this first excited state here, it's not going to contribute to the specific heat. It's not going to take any energy. So you have to have roughly amount of energy here. And the rule here, oh, I think I called this script, I think I called this script E. This energy difference here is typically, on, typically the same as the ground state energy. Okay, it's on the same order as the ground state energy. So here's, here's, the, here's sort of the bottom line here. You, you're focusing your attention on the degree of freedom. You've got this molecule. It's being bombarded by other molecules. The typical energy of a molecule there is going to be kT. The typical energy of a molecule coming and in, banging into this thing is going to be kT. If kT is much less, suppose kT is much less than, did I call it, what did I, you know. Suppose kT is much less than this, what's going to happen? Nothing. You're not going to excite it. We, there's a great name for this. This degree of freedom is called, it's frozen out. It's not contributing to the specific heat. It's not taking, absorbing any energy. It's frozen out of the specific heat. It's not playing a role. So eventually, as you increase the temperature, eventually you'll be able to excite this. Once the temperature is much greater than this, once you're on the other side here, where KT is much greater than this, now this mode is fully participating in the specific heat. So here's how we deal with this. We deal with, it with what's called a population function, H. This is a dimensionless function of temperature. So you focus your attention on a particular degree of freedom, all right? 
like what I was representing here. At low temperatures, H is equal to zero. H is uh, technically is the fraction of molecules in an excited state, okay? You can imagine you have an ensemble of these, the fraction that are up here. You can't say definitely whether it's here or there or not. You don't know, but on the average, you can make a statement. So down here, there's essentially no excitation here. H is equal to zero. As you increase the temperature, eventually at high, sufficiently high temperature, H is equal to one. That means the mode is fully participating in the specific heat. It's as if you had a continuum. The energy is so big here that all these lines, these energy levels here, get scrunched down so that we essentially are back to classical physics. And it has to transition from one to the other, and it transitions about the only reasonable way it can. And it goes like there's a kind of knee in here. This temperature right here, this characteristic temperature, is called the Debye temperature. And it is when it's the temperature for which these two things are equal, roughly equal. That's the Debye temperature right here. Uh, okay, so we can now write down, this looks a little complicated, but it's actually not. We can write down what the heat capacity is here of, of a system. Okay, we're going to let n be the number, as above there, it'll be the number of degrees of freedom that are fully involved in the specific heat. They're essentially classical. You know, the inner, you don't have to worry about the discretization of energy. Quantum mechanics is not playing a role. So this is classical, okay? But then there are these other degrees of freedom, like this one here. If our temperature is, is down, is, you know, is right here. Suppose the temperature is right roughly here. This is just a sketch, incidentally. The temperature is here. You can see that this mode is partially participating in the specific heat. It's not fully participating. So that's quantified by the H function here. H won't be 1. It'll be between 0 and 1. So each of these degrees of freedom contribute. They're going to contribute to the specific heat by R over 2. And then it's going to be this number that's less than 1. You know, it's, if it's a half, they're, and on the average, contributing half of their full amount to the specific heat. <coughs> So the little n is the partial degrees of freedom. So here's some examples. Uh, monatomic gases only have three degrees of freedom, okay? Now, actually, I was thinking about this. I suspect there are some possible modes, internal modes, of a monatomic. But I, th I think that's probably extremely high frequency. I don't know. But I think there's such high frequency, they're going to be frozen out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the point is this, is that when you have, when the temperature is low, and this is what we mean by low, they're essentially all going to be in here. But there, occasionally one will bump up here, just due to, it's all a probabilistic thing, right? But as you increase the temperature, then you start to see more and more in here, and, and some will be up here too. Okay? Yeah. So there's essentially only three for, I think, monatomic gases. For diatomic gases, you've got the three translational, and then you'll notice that we've got two rotational here. Why is that? Why aren't there three? A um, diatomic molecule we can think of as sort of like a dumbbell like this, right? This is a diatomic molecule. And it's got, there are three different axes here. We always have three axes. So there'll be rotations about the x-axis, rotation about the y-axis. What about the z-axis? Well, it looks like it should contribute here, okay, but there's a problem. Or I don't know if it's a problem, but there's something going on here that distinguishes this from the other ones. Where's all the mass in this atom here? It's almost all in the nucleus, right? The moment of inertia here is extremely small because almost all the mass is in the nucleus, and the nucleus is really tiny. So this has a moment of inertia here that's much less than Ix and Iy. So what does that mean? Well, here's a, there's something else i got to tell you about quantum mechanics here for, for you to understand this. The angular momentum is quantized here. All right? So here you saw energy, energy quantization. Here it's also ang there's angular momentum that's being quantized. And the angular momentum has to be roughly Planck's constant, it turns out. 
So the angular momentum is the moment of inertia times the frequency. Remember your mechanics? The energy, analogous to 1 half mv squared, is 1 half i omega squared. Okay? You can write um, the energy as L squared over 2i. This is this analogous to P squared over twice the mass. M kinetic energy, P squared over This is the rotational analog. I need to edit this a little bit. But the point is this. L is constant here. L is typically on the order of Planck's constant. So when the moment of inertia becomes really small, what happens here? This becomes huge. The, and so what does that mean? It means this for the rotational, for IZ there, this is way up there. So what does that mean? It's frozen out. So this is frozen out. This is frozen out. Um, where's the vibrational mode here? What, ha what happened to that? It's there, but typically you have, to, you have to go to such high, as you go to high, you have to go to high temperature. And eventually the molecule is going to dissociate. So it's all, it's all over after that. But before you get to there, often you can see a rise in the specific heat due to, the, it, it partially plays a role in diatomic. It, it's a partial, it's, you know, H is not close to zero. It's playing a partial role. Uh, for more complicated molecules, you can have, oh, I need to edit this, don't I? <laughs> uh, okay. I don't have vibrational in there. So for, once you get away from this, things being on a line here, now you're going to pick up the three rotational modes, okay? You can also get bending modes, as we will see in carbon dioxide, and you can have vibrational modes. I need, I'll put that in there. Okay, so here's, um, here's the idea. Um, the, here's how this is going to affect us. The, what's important to us in acoustics is gamma, the ratio of the specific heats, as we've seen. For gases, there's a, a simple thermodynamic relationship between the two specific heats. Cp is just Cv plus R. I think we, we might have mentioned this before. I can't remember. That holds true for gases. So at least for, for gases here, we can um, substitute this into here, into gamma. And we get this. So um, one of the things this allows us to do is because the specific heats can be accurately measured, you can accurately determine gamma here. And uh, as long as you're away from any Debye temperature in there, okay, as long as the degree of free, you know, looking at our examples here, as long as you're not where there's a partial, where a mode is partially contributing to the specific heat, we get these different values for different, different substances here. Due to the quantum mechanics, we get different end values, and here's the gamma, and this works well. As long as you're away from a divide temperature, this works well for gamma. Okay, so now let's just begin briefly here our acoustic calculation. Um, uh, I wanted to do a page of this. I think we're out of time, right? Yeah, yeah. okay, so let me just, oh, I got a minute, I think. Um, <coughs> how, do we, how do we deal with acoustics here? Well, how do we handle this acoustically? Well, we've got these heat, the sound waves coming by, it's gonna excite these internal modes, it's gonna have an effect on the heat capacities. And because, there's gonna, because we're doing this all at some frequency, there's going to be time delays, right? How do we handle that? The way we're going to handle it is we're going to go complex on the C, on the heat capacities here. So all this means is we're not, it, when we do this, this is just a, a scalar, when we do this quasi, do it quasi-statically. But we're not doing things quasi-statically, we're doing it at some frequency. So because there can be a phase lag there, That'll, that information will be in the complex nature of that we make these complex. So, and you can see where this is headed, right? 
So CP and CV are complex now. Assuming a gas, we have this. This is bold. I don't know if you can tell, but it's, it's a bold. <clears throat> this will become complex because these are complex, right? And now, because gamma is complex, the speed of sound will be complex. And what does that mean? Do you remember yesterday? We're going to get, that gives us attenuation. So we call it this phenomenological model. Well, now we've actually, we're going to be able to derive what that complex of speed. We're just not going to say, well, it's complex and use a fit parameter. We're going to be able to derive it from theory. But we know that we're headed on the right track here when we see a complex C, because we know that the imaginary part of this can give rise to attenuation, as we saw yesterday. So we'll pick this up tomorrow from here.